Welcome back in, everybody. It is a pleasure to have you on board tonight. We appreciate you joining us. We are talking more offensive lines in the NFL, and specifically we're covering the middle group. Uh, me and Simon have, have been working on this project for weeks now, and um, we've already done the lower tier. You may have already seen that video. You may not. If you haven't, go check it out on this on the same platform. We thank you for being with us. Simon, how are you doing tonight, man? I'm I'm doing great, Ben. I'm pumped. I'm having so much fun doing this. It's great to see the, the fruits of the labor, and I'm ready to keep going here with this middle group. We've already gotten rid of at least our five worst teams. In your case, we've gotten rid of your nine worst. Yeah. Um, I still have some red ink showing on the table here. We'll get to those shortly, I'm sure. And we are covering the middle group. So we left off in the last video with number 24, and that brings us to your number 23 team, which is? Uh, here at 23. I have the Tennessee Titans, Ben. Um, if you if you guys watched our AFC South rankings, the, so this is my one group that after the divisional ranking or after the divisional videos, I went back through to put my official rankings together, and I just came out when when seeing the Titans up against all the other teams, I, I didn't like them as much as I did when we were going division by division, and here's why: when for so long, uh, when I was prepping for the Titans. It was before, uh, mostly even before minicamp and, and, you know, OTAs, things like that. And before training camp, which is now a week away for, for most teams, um, you know, was a lot more theoretical. So the line I had put together for the Titans was going to be Taylor Luan, Dylan Radunes, uh, Ben Jones. Um, let me pull them back up here. Uh, Nate Davis and then Nicholas petit Frere. So I had them going with their two young guys who, who I like. Radunes had a pretty good year last year as a rookie. Luan, who's on a downswing for sure, but it's still going to be at least an above average left tackle. Ben Jones, who, who's a top center in the league. Nate Davis was a pretty good young guy. So, so I like their group. I graded them a B in our divisional video, despite the fact that just before we hopped on is when we were starting to catch up on some of the, the training camp hype. And there's going to be a position battle at left guard and right tackle for them. Um, Aaron Brewer and, uh, and, uh, Jamarco Jones are going to be battling out for left guard. Dylan Radunes and Nicholas P.T. Frere are going to be battling out for right tackle. That makes me a lot more nervous about where this group is than I expected, because if, if Radunes and Petit Frere for being high draft picks aren't slam dunk, let's get them on the field, similar to the Dolphins who we talked about want to get their young guys on the field then that means they're maybe not quite as good, or at least the Titans don't feel they're quite as good as where I thought they were. And now they have Jamarco Jones, who's a journeyman, and Aaron Brewer, who's an undrafted young guy, uh, battling out for position. That doesn't make me feel good either. So I ended up knocking them down to a C plus from the B, so down to, you know, grade points, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I have them here at 23. Like I said, Luan, downswing. He had a rough year last year. Ben Jones is still a top center. Nate Davis is still pretty good, but, but left guard and right tackle being question marks here, you know, make, make me a little nervous. So I still think they're going to be above average. I have them as a C plus, I think they will be a tick above. Um, but, but ultimately I'm not as high on them as I was just, you know, last week. Even. I, our analysis of this team is the same. I've got them at number 20 in terms of rankings, but we'll hit this, we'll hit this all the way through. For me personally, you could take number 18 all the way through number 23 and just flip a coin. Mm -hmm. They're basically the same yep. offensive line. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll have different teams in that group, but we're flipping coins here. So I've got them at number 20. You could, you could slide them up or down. I don't care. But the same thing, you mentioned it. When we went through and did our grades, I liked them a little bit better than when I went back through and started comparing them to the other teams in the league. And I was like, wow, you know, this is not as good as I kind of sort of was hoping for now. Do I trust the Titans franchise to figure this out and have a pretty good offensive line by midseason? I think I do, but there's still a couple of holes here, and I'm not sure those holes are going to get a whole lot better as the season goes along. Um, Taylor Luan will hold down left tackle in spite of the age. Nate Davis, very good center in the league, one of the top guys. We'll have a center's list later. Nate Davis will hold down right guard, but you got position battles at center and right tackle. You mentioned it. And there are no slam dunk guys there. And I'm not sure that come October and Thanksgiving, there's going to be slam dunk guys there, to be honest. So I think they'll put together a competitive group. I think they'll be fine, but I don't think they're going to push people around most weeks. And I think the Titans offensive lines that we have seen in the past could on some weeks push people around. 
it was an advantage in some weeks. I don't think they're going to have that this year. So got them on a downgrade. They'll be fine. C minus, number 20 for me, number 23 for you. Uh, next for you on the list, number 22. Yeah, so, and I'm with you. I had 23 to 17. I have all as C pluses. And this was the hardest group I had to rank in this range. And, and I'd be fine really with everything. It's just about figuring out what's important to you, right? And so that, that this is where we're going to see the most of that, I think. So for me, the Titans not having a tackle spot locked down and an additional question mark puts them in the lowest end of this group. For the Cardinals, for me, I have them here at 22. And, and part of that is I think they have their positions a little more locked down from a starting standpoint. Their depth, they have, uh, uh, you know, I'd say they probably go six deep in terms of who you really like be okay with seeing out on the field. Uh, but the age of this group is, is kind of what gets me. They're, they're a little bit on the older side. I think everybody that's projected to be, excuse me, in their starting lineup is, is 30 years or older. So, so from left to right, that's DJ Humphreys, Justin Pugh, Rodney Hudson, Will Hernandez, and Kelvin Beecham. Now I will say if Rodney Hudson is healthy, um, that's a good sign for them because they had Max Garcia, who's now on the Giants, play a lot of games at center last year, and that was that was pretty bad for them. Um, Will Hernandez, actually, coming from the Giants, is definitely going to be an upgrade if he it gets to start next to Hudson at center. So uh, their starting five is pretty good. Uh, I think they can sustain one injury, but, but Hudson has had some injury history. Pugh has had some injury history at left guard. Um, you're counting a lot on DJ Humphreys being your, you know, your top guy, if, especially if those guys go down and, and you don't have a lot of depth behind that. So the, this group is, I think, just, you know, you maybe you want something else, uh, but there, it's also hard to fault them because, you know, you look at all of these guys on, and on paper, they're all pretty good. I, I think it's just, you know, uh, assuming an injury is going to happen and what happens in that case, it, it can go downhill pretty quick for me there. And there's not one thing that stands out from, from any of them. I think the biggest thing that was talked about for this group last year was Rodney Hudson coming in, being that veteran center to, to Kyler Murray and how big of an impact that made. And then once he got hurt, then we didn't really have anything else to say about their offensive line. So it's five solid dudes. Again, that's all you need for, for a, an offensive line uh, to, for your team to be in contention, to win games, uh, compete for a Super Bowl. But Nothing really stands out from this group. So I have the Cardinals here at 22. You're at 22. I'm at 26. For me, they are still one of the red ink teams. I really wanted to like this offensive line because mm -hmm. there are so many recognizable names. Uh, there's mm -hmm. DJ Humphreys, Rodney Hudson, Justin Pugh, Kelvin Beecham, uh, Will Hernandez. I, it, there are so many recognizable names. But you mentioned the age thing really kicks in hard with this team. Yeah, probably more than any other team in the NFL, except maybe the Eagles. Um, I think it's harder here because Kelvin Beach Beecham is not what he used to be, as, as you know better than anybody. Uh, DJ Humphreys, solid left tackle. Is he going to be able to ring the bell every yeah. week and, and play top? Um, Rodney Hudson is the huge question mark injury-wise that you mentioned. We both love Rodney Hudson. Who doesn't love Rodney Hudson, right? But is he going to be able to answer the bell every single week? Those are three guys right there that you have serious question marks about, A, will they even be on the field? And, B, how close to what they used to be are they still? And so those are huge question marks. And then you, you introduce um, Will Hernandez and Justin Pugh, who will hold their own, but they're not going to dominate. You have five solid guys, like you mentioned, but there is no stud here. There's nobody that you look at and go, that guy's an all pro or a pro bowler. We know it. it. Well, maybe none of these guys, maybe none of them. And the depth isn't horrible. I've got, I, I've got Sean Harlow as an interior guy who I like depth wise. And then I think I've got Justin Murray as a possible depth guy. So it's six or seven deep, but that's not great either. You mentioned it. One guy goes down pretty much any of these starting guys. And, you know, it starts to fall apart very quickly. So, right there with you on the Cardinals. Um, they could have a good offensive line this year, but they needed a lot of things to break in their favor, and I'm not sure they're all going to. So um, Cardinals 26 for me, 22 for you, and number 21 for you. All right, I think – so I think you and I are fairly aligned on this next team, but I think this is where we vary the most from general consensus. Here at 21, 
and I say that now, and you're probably going to tell me you have them ranked 10th or something like that. <laughs> yes. I, have, I have the New England Patriots. I have the Patriots here at 21. Um, this is – I can't wait to hear what, what you're going to tell me about them. I um, have them at 10. I got to tell you. I got oh, them at 10. my gosh. How did I know that was going to happen? How did I I'm know? I'm sorry. That's, no, that's great. That's great. I'm so glad I, I know you. We've learned a lot about each other in these last few months. Um, all right, so here's where I'm at on the Patriots. When we wrapped up the divisional preview – I was also lower on them than you were at the time, I believe, not not by right. much, but through just through our conversation, I was like, I really need to go back and watch this team more. Right. Here's the thing with the Patriots. They're very good in pass pro. Uh, that is for sure. They're very good in pass pro. You go watch their tape last year. They're great. My issue is, and, and the thing that puts them above the Titans, so I mentioned with the Titans, where they don't have, a, they're missing a tackle. The Patriots have two legitimate starting good tackles uh, just a little bit better than the Cardinals which is where I, or maybe significantly better I don't know moderately whatever you want to call it their tackles are better than the Cardinals so so that's my that's my building block I like Isaiah Wynn I like Trent Brown David Andrews at center is fine he's probably like your definition of just like a solid don't worry about him center but he's not going to add too much to you I'm very nervous about the guard position Cole Strange, they bring in. He's going to play. Uh, which side is he going on? Is he going. On? I think he's going on the left side. Um, which was uh, Ted Karras for them last year, I want to say. Uh, but anyways, Cole Strange is coming in, uh, a rookie who we don't know a lot about. A lot of people had him projected as a day two kind of guy. Uh, obviously, when when the Patriots are like the Spurs, right? So if someone if they take somebody that you weren't thinking of, that means. They're actually probably pretty good. That rule hasn't super applied to the Patriots for the last few years, so we have to see what's going to happen. Oh. Um, Michael Owenu is a guy that is good in pass pro, which is why he's he's rated highly on, on PFF and stuff like that. Uh, run blocking, I do not like him as much. I think he kind of falls off blocks. I don't think he gets the same push, uh, uses that dominance, uses that strength that he you know uses in pass protection. But the guy got benched last year. Uh, Michael and Wenu started uh, seven actual games in the starting lineup last year. I think he's credited with eight because I think they came out on the first play and he was a tackle eligible in one of those games. Um, but he started three games at guard, which is where he's projected this year. Uh, four games, four games, didn't finish the fourth one. He got pulled out of the fourth game against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers week four. Um, and he did not, he was not in the starting lineup consistently again after that. He started week seven through nine at right tackle for Trent Brown. Um, so he did get some playing time there. But this was a guy his rookie year afterwards. He was a six round pick. He started every game at guard. And everybody thought this was the next like Patriots gym, Patriots diamond in the rough that they just found. And he's going to be a 10 year starting offensive lineman. And then by year two, he's, he got benched for Ted Karras. Who, who's now, you know, on the Bengals and, you know, you know, who has kind of been your just like average center, a little like your, your Dave Andrews kind of, kind of through the, through the NFL. I'm nervous about that. Everyone's just kind of projecting like, Oh, he's just gonna, he's going to get right back to where he was his rookie year. If Bill Belichick benches you, it's for a good reason. Now, has he used this whole past season to kind of figure out what he was messing up and, and he's going to get back on track and he's going to be good to go possibly. Um, but as it stands right now, with you know, you've got your two good tackles, you've got a fine center, but I have major question marks at, at both guard spots. And again, I have them graded as a C plus. So this is going to be an above average group. Strange and Owenu could be, you know, pro bowl level guards from, from day one. I don't know. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, but I just don't know. So, so I have them down here in, in this, in, in this tier, in this middle group uh, ranked at, I already forgot the number at, at 21. Um, for, for those questions. Could they be, like I said, up as high as 17? Sure. Um, but I just, I don't, I don't know. All right, so I have them right here at 21 for now. And I've got them at number 10. <laughs> That's so funny. That's hilarious. That's, so are, are you, here. are you just higher on on one than I am or higher on strange than I am? Or do you just value those tackles a lot more than I'm valuing them right now? It, it's the guards. I'm not okay. higher on the tackles. I think we agree on the tackles. Uh, uh, Trent Brown, Isaiah Wynn, 
don't usually dominate, but they'll hold their own. They'll be good, good. fine starting yeah. tackles. You're probably – if you were going to upgrade those positions, it would be because you're paying somebody a whole lot less money or because uh, it, it would not be easy to upgrade the tackle spots. I'll put it that way. Um, yeah. I think I'm a little higher on David Andrews at the center spot than you. Not a lot. Mm-hmm. I will admit That's this. Fair. Andrews is inconsistent. So there are weeks yep. where he looks really good, really smooth, really polished. And then other weeks, like, well, what's happened here? You know, um, mm-hmm. so it is down to the guard spots. And I know two things that are kicking in here. Number one is I still trust, and I think the media does, it, all the rankings lists do, trust the Patriots franchise maybe more than we should. And we talked about this during the division videos. We're still giving credit to the Patriots organization for being able to draft some no name and turn them into a stud because they're so good at scheming. And they're so good at teaching and they're so good at putting a guy in the right position. And they probably still are good at that. But that's starting to, the farther we get away from Brady years, that's starting to come into question more. So no doubt about it. They're getting a boost from my rankings and from other people's rankings for the Patriot factor. We just assume that they're going to figure it out. So that's one reason I've got them up at number 10. Uh, The other thing is when it comes to the guards here, uh, especially Mike on on Winu. I know he's not somebody I've done as much tape on as you. So I'm actually, you have actually basically talked me into already downgrading the Patriots from number 10 on the list. Okay. So based on everything we've talked about in the last video and in this one, uh, I'm not going to stick to that number 10. There, you know, there's some things I'll stick to hardcore because I put in a lot of homework. Um, I'll allow the chiefs and I'll allow the tackles on the chiefs, things like that. Uh, this is not one of them. Okay. So, I'm going to yield to you. I think you've put in a lot more video work here on Mike on Winu. Could he be, you know, a good starting guard here in the NFL? Possibly, but I think I've, I think I've put a little bit too much into the hype machine here on a Winu, a little bit too much into the potential, and a little bit too much into the Patriots' um, development that that may that's starting to come into question here. So, I'm willing to back off that number ten ranking by a good bit. Um, you know. How about TBD? One thing I will say, they don't have any depth here. There's very, there's almost no depth. That's the other thing. Yep. Um, that's the big kicker. Um, so, I, again, I'm kind of sort of trusting the Patriots to figure out the depth thing, but they may not. You know, they struggled last year. So, who's to say they're going to figure it out this year? Um, you know, let's uh, – I, so, I'm at number 10, but I'm willing to come off of that. You're at number uh, 21, I think, for the Patriots. Um, number 20 for you. Funny, another team that I, that I feel pretty passionately about, and uh, I, I think this is about the right spot for them. I might be a little lower yet again. I think I value guard more than more than the average. I think everyone likes tackle, everyone likes center, but but I'm finding guards really important to me. Uh, the Washington Commanders is who I have here. Um, so so for Washington, they had one of the better groups in the league last year. So from but left to right this year. Uh, they're going to have Charles Leno Jr., Andrew Norwells coming over from Jacksonville, Chase Rulier, uh, I think w- was the starter for, for about half the season last year. He should be the full-time starter this year. Trey Turner is a guy that's coming over from Pittsburgh. And Sam Kosme it, was a rookie last year. He had a pretty good season. I think they were about a top 10 to 12 group last year, but they are moving on from two Pro Bowl level guards and Brandon Sheriff and Eric Flowers. I think that's a big drop off when you talk about those guys down to Norwell and Trey Turner, especially considering Trey Turner last year for Pittsburgh uh, had a solid season. He was fine, but he was also way healthier than anybody could have expected. He played all, he played and started in all 17 games last year, despite playing in the previous four seasons, nine games, 13 games, 13 and 13. Uh, So a guy that is 29 this year, going to clearly on the other side of his career. He's not the same, you know, pro bowl, all pro potential kind of guy that he was in Carolina early in his career. Um, and, and same with Norwell. He's, he's on the upper ages as well. And just not what he was when he was younger and the drop off from flowers and sheriff to those guys is going to be really big. And I don't think the likes of Leno, Rulier and coast are going to uh, keep, keep them afloat the way they were. Now it's still going to be an above average group, um, I like the fact here's where I am with against the Patriots. I have them one tick above the Patriots because uh, Wes Schweitzer is in there in the guard mix as well. He could easily end up winning one of those guard positions. Um, and he played pretty well in the games he played last year. 
So Schweitzer is what gives uh, the commanders one step above the Patriots for me, just someone in the mix in that guard position that I'm worried about um, that the Patriots don't have. So I have the commanders here at 20. All right. Um, I've, I, this is a pretty big gap in terms of rankings, but I think we're kind of agreed on some of this. I'm, a, I'm at number 13 for the commanders, actually. Mm. Um, I don't have them in my green group, the top tier, but they're right at the top of my average group here or, you know, mid, middle tier, let's call it. So you're at 20. I'm at 13. Here, here's the breakdown for me. Um, love Brandon Scherf. So losing him is a big deal. I've never been as high on Eric Flowers as I think a lot of other people are. Um, to me, he falls into the category of when he gets his hands on you, he's impossible to beat, but a lot of times he doesn't get his hands on you. So that's, Mm. that's where I'm at with flowers. And again, he's gotten better in recent seasons, but I think he benefited a lot from being on the Washington commanders offensive line, previous offensive lines he was on. He really didn't show up. I think when he gets to his next stop, maybe that's going to be some problems again, but we'll leave that off for now. What do they actually have? Charles Leno at left tackle. I think that's a no-doubt starter right there. Um, slightly above average at left tackle there for Leno. I think I'm higher on Schweitzer than you are at the guard spot. I, I think he wins that position um, for me personally. Chase Rulie, he was injured for half of last year. I've got Rulie. I'll go ahead and give you a sneak peek at my centers. I've got Chase Rulie somewhere in my top five of centers in the NFL. Oh, so I, okay. I really, really like him. Now, he's not powerful, so you're missing that aspect of it, but I like everything else that Rulier offers. Um, And, again, he's not a dominant center, but as centers go, I've got him in my top five for a sneak preview. Um, And then I Cosme and and, and I think probably Norwell could probably hold down those starting spots. I think they'll be fine. So, good starting five. I'm counting Rulier as uh, as a stud, as one of the guys who has a chance at Pro Bowl if he's healthy. And then here's the kicker. Um, To me – these guys go 10 deep. To me, they have one of the deepest benches in all of football. Um, one of the top two or three depth benches in all the game. And that starts with Sadiq Charles, um, Cornelius Lucas I like, Tyler Larson gives you a chance, um, Keith Ismael sometimes gives you a decent chance, uh, Trey Turner gives you a chance. He, might, uh, he may very well win the starting spot there. He may already be locked into the starting spot. Um, I, I, they go about nine or 10 deep for me. So because, because this offensive line isn't dominant and because they have so many pieces on the bench that I like, if somebody does get injured, I don't think there's a huge drop-off here. So I've got them at number 13. But, again, um, probably, numbers, probably numbers 10 through 15 for me are almost all interchangeable as well. So a um, little bit difference there, but those are some of the reasons why I think I'm higher on a couple of the players there. Um, that was number uh, 20 for you. Is that right? Yep. Great. Yeah, all right. Let's go to number 19. 19, we're sticking in the NFC East. I have the uh, New York football giants here at 19, surprisingly. Um, uh, to, to compare them to Washington, since, again, we're all – this is all in the same group. And, again, so you, you had Washington at 13. That's still my, like, middle average group that we'll cover here in this video. So, again, that's right. a big range that uh, we're splitting hairs at this point. But – for me and the Giants, I just I don't have any question marks on the offensive line. I, I have some in the starting lineup for Washington and for New England. Um, despite you know both teams having at least good tackles, that puts them above Arizona, Tennessee, New York. I have two good tackles: Andrew Thomas, Evan Neal. I'm really excited for um, New York. And I might have been too quick to say this. I only have one question mark on the offensive line, not two. Uh, so left guard is Max Garcia, who we talked about from Arizona. Uh, Joshua Azudu is, is competing with him. Uh, Azudu was a uh, draft pick by them uh, this year, I believe, from from UNC. Yep. Um, so so he's he's very much in the mix for that that starting spot. But uh, and if one of those guys can claim it and look pretty good, now I think Max Garcia Garcia is a better guard than he is center where he played for Arizona last year. So I think he could look a little bit better, especially because the rest of this group I'm excited for John Feliciano. Uh, they brought over, uh, remember Brian Dayball, offensive coordinator for the, for the bills is now here with the giants as the head coach. Feliciano has essentially said he's coming over to play center, which I believe is where he played in college, even though he played guard here in the NFL. Um, and, and he's excited to play center. And I think that's where they're going to put him. They also got Mark Lewinsky, who, who I have pretty highly ranked among guards. Um, he's coming over from the Colts. 
this offensive line is just a new group. It, it's a it's a different mentality than they've had in the last couple of years where this was one of the worst groups in the NFL. Um, Andrew Thomas, you know, we talked about before, had a nice season last year, really improved a lot. And if he can even just stay where he was at last year, he's an above average left tackle, which is a really good place to be uh, in this league. So, so if you're Andrew Thomas, John Feliciano, Mark Lewinsky, Evan Neal, I think those are four like deadlock starting offensive linemen. Um, you have kind of a wild card there at one of the spots, but I think you're okay with that. And I think they have some pretty good depth as well. Uh, Will Pert, I believe, um, is a tackle that you would, wouldn't mind, or Matt Pert, Matt Pert, sorry, um, is a guy you wouldn't mind getting into the game a little bit. So let's say, let's say the left guard position doesn't work out. Uh, with, with either Azudu or Garcia. Evan Neal is a guy that played guard in college, and a big reason that he was highly touted in this draft is he can play four positions on the line if you need him to. If you get in a pinch and you want to stick him at left guard and let Matt Pert play right tackle, that that might not be too bad of an option if you know Garcia or Azudu don't quite handle that left guard spot. And then if you're talking about Andrew Thomas Evan Neal and John Feliciano from your, on your left side there, that's, that's a pretty good group that, that you'd like to see. So there's some question marks. Uh, there's some moving around that's going to happen. There is some projection also involved with this. How are these guys going to fare uh, you're, when you're putting four new pieces on an offensive line? That's why they're still this low, even though I think the talent is high. Um, but I have New York sitting here at, uh, what's this, number 19. Here's the good news for Giants fans, and they already know this. The offensive line is already way better than it was the past two or three years, uh, which is ironic because the former GM, we won't call his name, bless his heart, he was big on developing offensive and defensive lines. Uh, it just didn't work out, okay? Um, the offensive line is already better. And come see me in 2023, I'm going to be high on this offensive line. Not as high as you are on it. You mentioned some of the horses based on projection. Um, I've got them checking in here at uh, – sorry, give me just a second here. I've got them at number 25. For me, they're still at the high end of the red ink teams. For me, there's a lot of hope here. Start with Andrew Thomas. You mentioned it. If all he does is stay the same, he's already an above-average left tackle. I think he can get better. I think you probably do too. At the yep. left tackle spot, yep. I think this guy could develop into a pro bowler. I, I don't think yep. there's any question about it. And, again, I haven't checked. I don't pay attention to the pro bowl teams very often, to be honest because um, there's so much mixed voting that goes on in there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Maybe he's already made a Pro Bowl. I don't know. But I don't think so. I doubt if it. he has it, this uh, guy could be uh -huh. a Pro Bowler legit. Yep, <laughs> so, yep for sure. Anyway, um, we're both high on Evan Neal. Maybe not this year because there's always a rookie curve, especially mm -hmm. on the offensive lines, but um, very high on Evan Neal at the other tackle spot. And, again, if they want to move him to guard, they can. I think he'll be good there too. Um, at the other guard spot, at the first guard spot, Mark Glowinski, like him too. Uh, you can put, you can ink him in as the starter, and you're not worried about the upgrades for a season or two. You're fine there. Me personally, when it comes to the other two spots, I have them graded lower than you. Um, I, Max Garcia, to me, is a big worry. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not even totally sure that – I'm really not even comfortable with them looking at him as a starter right now. Um, could he get better than that? Yes, but I haven't seen it. And then when it comes to John Feliciano – I count him as depth. I don't really like him as a starter either. Um, it, and again, that's just based on it's just based on what I've seen so far. But again, sometimes who you play with matters. Who's on your left and your right? I'm gonna talk about that with some of the other teams here as we start to scroll up the list here. Who you're getting to play beside matters a lot. So can Feliciano, if he's beside Thomas, or if he's beside uh, 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 sorry Glowinski, or if he's beside Neil, can can he do better? Yeah. Now, I do like the Giants' depth. I think they go about nine deep here. Um, I think there's about nine guys who you wouldn't mind seeing on the football field for at least four games this season. Um, so I like all of that, like the depth. But at, at the moment, to me, they're still a year away is really what I'm getting at. So next year, I think they could be one of the top maybe 12, 15 offensive lines. This year, I kind of still have them at the, at the lower end for number 25. Number 18 for you. Uh, the team – that got all of this started for us that I was so excited to get into uh, here at 18. I have the Carolina Panthers. Um, again, this is going to be a little bit of projection, but I think we're even higher on this guy where we're going to start uh, than we are on Evan Neal. And that's Ikki Um, I think he's going to change this offensive line completely. Now, of course, the coaching staff and, and what they do on offense also needs to change. Um, 
but I really like where they're starting there. Left guard, I think they're going to put, or at least I'm willing it into existence, Brady Christensen. Um, yeah. Let that guy play one position all year long. And whichever one you pick, it's going to be pretty good. Uh, but he played three different spots last year in his rookie year uh, as a second round pick. Not really what you want when the rest of the offensive line and the rest of the team is bad. So let that guy play left guard all year long next to Icky. And, and if Icky has some issues with left tackle as a rookie, you can always flip him because left tackle is what Brady Christensen played last year and through the majority of his college career. So if you guys, if you have those two guys as your left side, uh, and you either swap them out for each other once during the season at most, that's a pretty good group. Now they upgraded the rest of the, the middle here with Bradley Bozeman from the Ravens and Austin Corbett from the Rams. Bozeman, I have my issues with. He doesn't always play with great balance, but he's physical. He plays with really good push. I think that's where they're going with this offensive line. They're trying to build an identity um, with, with Icky, who's a very physical, very nasty offensive lineman in his own right. Uh, Brady Christensen, who's a big, strong guy. Bradley Bozeman is, is a Baltimore Raven, AFC North kind of guy. Um, he's going to get pushed. He's going to be physical there at center. Austin Corbett, this is, I do have a slight question here just with the style. Uh, he's a little different. He's a little undersized, um, comes from the Rams, comes from the zone blocking scheme. So what exactly are they going to do? But he's a good offensive lineman who's been in the Super Bowl, he's, he, and he's not a liability. Um, and then Taylor Moten at right tackle, just so, you know, you can count on that guy 100% of the time. You have no problems there. You don't even have to think about it. So I like the, the draft equity they put in here. Uh, they have a first-round pick, a second-round pick based on, you know, what I'm projecting at left guard, uh, two, you know, mid-tier free agent signings in Bozeman and Corbett, and then Taylor Moten, who's your, you know, kind of consistent plug-and-play guy. Um, Depth-wise, I like a little bit of what they have. Pat Elfine, he can play guard or he's mostly a backup center, but he can play a little guard if you need him to. Um, Cade Mays, a, a six-round pick from the draft. He's a guy that I think could play four, maybe even five positions on this offensive line if you really need. Wow. So I like what they're doing. But I, this is my first group where I like all five starters. And again, that's assuming they put Brady Christensen in at left guard. Um, and and I, just, I really like the tackles and uh, I like some of the flexibility they have. I've got them at number uh, – sorry, I've got them at number 27. This was this was the team I was wondering when you were going to get uh -huh. to them because we kept climbing up the list here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's start with – we have with one more the, like that. Yeah, I, I think we do too. And, and you know, that's, that's fine. I, I know we do. We both know who that team is. <laughs> but, anyway, let, let me start off with the guy that I love, and that's Ikemi Kwanu. Um, Studied, I've studied a million miles of tape about Iquano, probably more than any uh, any other rookie except for uh, the Michigan defensive end uh, who got drafted early on in the draft. I can't remember his name at the moment. But anyway, um, love Ikemi Iquano. There's nothing he can't do. Might take him a year or two to kick in. Uh, this guy this guy's amazing. Pass block, run block. Um, he can get second level and actually block people at second level. He's not just hanging out, occupying space. Mm -hmm. He can come all mm -hmm. the way across the offensive line and block people on the other end. He can pull all the way from tackle. He is that fast. He can pull all the way from tackle all the way across the other end of the offensive line right. and do all kinds of screen plays and crazy junk on the other side. There, there's nothing he can't do, but it will take time to kick in. And, and so one reason probably for our differences in grades is I'm not giving them a lot of credit for him stepping in right away and doing that. But he might. Maybe he is that good, and that's kind of the experiment, right? Yep. You take a top Absolutely. draft pick, and how much can they impact the position group in season one? And right. sometimes it's a lot, sometimes it's not. So love Iquano, tackle guard, whatever, wherever you want to put him, he'll, he'll be fantastic. You mentioned Taylor Moten at right tackle. You know, lock him in, throw away the key. He's there at right tackle. Um, after that, for me, for me, there's a huge drop-off. Corbett can hold on, can hold his own at guard. Um, I don't think I'm as high on Bozeman as you are, probably for the reasons you mentioned, actually. Um, I, I just don't give him as high a grade. But you know, I, I like that they have somebody there. It helps them compete. And, and then uh, at the fifth starting spot, there's a, there's a whole lot of things going on. But Brady Christensen, I definitely think he should get that left guard spot. Um, and I do look the, – the grade that I gave him in year one, his first year, it is not fair for me to expect that in year two. I should probably be projecting him to improve a lot in year two 
and I probably haven't allowed enough for that. So if I were really going to to grade this accurately, I'd probably give them a little bit of a boost there just because I should be expecting more out of Christensen than we got in year one. I think you're all over that. And depth-wise, they're fine. Uh, I, I got them about seven deep. Um, I don't think there's a huge fall off here outside of maybe right tackle, uh, right tackle and Iquando as well uh, in terms of if somebody gets injured, there being a huge fall off. So uh, that's the reasons for the differences. Um, got the Panthers at 27. You got them at 18. So number 17 on your list. 17. So this is the last in my C plus group. So, so from the Titans at the start of this video to here, I have a couple teams that we're still going to hit for the, the middle of the league, but in terms of my last, just a tick above average, I have the Baltimore Ravens. And, and the thing that I like the most about the Ravens and also hate the most about the Ravens as a Steeler fan is they seem to have 11 or 12 offensive linemen every year. So, so if you see somebody on the injury report or you see somebody get benched or something, you're like, great, they're going to have a backup offensive lineman in. Well, that guy has three years of starting experience and he's, you know, actually pretty good. Um, so that's, that's a huge bummer, but left to right with this group right now. I mean, this is also some projection because we actually just got a confirmation today that left tackle Ronnie Stanley is starting the off season on the PUP list. Now, of course he can come off of it at any time. This is really just a, a mechanism for them to keep an extra person on their training camp roster until he's ready to be a full go. So it doesn't mean he's going to be out week one or anything. Uh, but it means he's not necessarily healthy for the start of training camp. So that's something to keep an eye on. That's what we talked about in the divisional rankings, um, because without him, this group is just a bunch of like pretty good guys uh, left to right. If they were to if have Stanley for week one, it's Ronnie Stanley. They have Ben Powers, uh, Tyler Linderbaum, Kevin Zeitler, Morgan Moses. Um, they also have Patrick McCarry and, and Tyree Phillips in the mix there. Ben Powers to me is, is uh, probably a below average starting offensive lineman, but he's a big physical guy. Uh, Kevin Zeitler is a good offensive lineman. He's pretty solid. You, you don't necessarily want him as your second best guy, which is where they're at right now. And he was their best guy last year, which is why their offensive line was, was such a struggle last year. Uh, you don't really want that. Morgan Moses is a guy I like, and I, I, I am waiting for that tape to fall off a little bit just based on, age and the way he plays he's a very big strong physical dude um but at some point his his feet just aren't going to work the same way based on his size and the way he plays so i'm waiting to see when that's going to fall off they had alejandro villanueva last year and that they got him at the time that he fell off is this morgan moses this year um patrick mccarry i swear i've seen that guy play every single position just even just against the steelers let alone you know and in, in all the seasons he's been in the league He's pretty good. Tyree Phillips is a guy that is guard and tackle capable. You like him better at guard, though. Um, so they just they have a lot of guys in this mix. Tyler Linderbaum is going to be a really interesting case for them. You know, we just talked about Bradley Bozeman. Yeah, overall, as a player, you don't like Bradley Bozeman all that much. If he's your center, you would obviously like to upgrade it. But he fits what you do in the AFC North in terms of just give me a big physical guy that can push. Tyler Linderbaum is who we've been talking about with like the Garrett Bradbury's of the world, where it's your undersized Uber athletic zone blocking scheme. What that guy is going to look like in the AFC North going against uh, Cam Hayward, uh, Trey Hendrickson, uh, let's see, Miles Garrett, if, he, if they slide him into the middle against this guy, it's not going to be uh, that pretty, I don't think, as a rookie. Um, obviously, he's a very, very good talent, very highly touted. I liked what they did to move around to get him in the draft. They got him at good value, kind of moving back uh, in, in round one. But yeah, I'm nervous about the fit and just what they're going to look like, what they're going to do, how they're going to play him. If Stanley isn't healthy, isn't ready for week one, and, and you know he's obviously missed the better part of the last two seasons, this group is just an average group, because mostly because I trust the Ravens to figure it out, put together, move these pieces around and, and be okay. And I like that they have a lot of pieces, but the pieces they have in place, the names, the guys, the talent just is not that high overall if Stanley is hurt. And even if he isn't, if Zeitler's your second best guy and then, you know, you're counting on either Morgan Moses to stay healthy or Linderbaum to, to be good from day one, um, you know, you're, you're in a rough group. And, and just to throw one more name out there as a guy I really like, 
Daniel Pa'alele uh, from Minnesota, the big tackle, he's going to be a problem in, in the NFL and in the AFC North for years to come. It's not going to be this year. You know, uh, the best case for him in the Ravens is if they have him on the roster as their fourth tackle. He's ineligible for most of the year for, for games, though. Um, but that dude is going to be a problem when he's game ready. It probably won't be this year, but it's just another good name that they have on, on the team there. You're at 17. I'm at 19 on the Ravens, so we're almost lockstep there on, on them. Everything you said is right. Um, if Ronnie Stanley is healthy, and that apparently might be a question mark at this point, if he's healthy, he's a stud, but he's their only stud. He's their only guy that mm-hmm. you look at and go, we have an advantage there at that position in most weeks. In most weeks, we are going to win that position and we'll build off of that position. He's the only one. After that, and give me just a second here, after that, I, there's just a lot of question marks. Um, you know, Morgan Moses has been solid at right tackle, but you mentioned when does the, when does the fall off start? Um, Kevin Zietler, uh, never dominant, but, you know, you, you kind of think maybe hold his own to some degree if he gets to play. Um, tons of question marks. Now, they have a lot of guys. You mentioned it. <laughs> at the end of their bench, they have Juwan James and Khalil McKenzie who have plenty of starts. Maybe they get at some point. I'm convinced Daniel Fa'alele probably won't start this year, but he's going to be a sixth offensive lineman at some point. They're just going to oh, go yeah. big. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know what's going to happen. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's going to hurt so bad. It's going right. to hurt they're so bad. They're going to stick him in at tight end uh-huh. tackle position. <laughs> and they're going to go six or seven big, and they're just yeah. going to try to push the ball downfield 1920 style. You know it's yeah, coming absolutely. this year. Absolutely. <laughs> so, but, but you mentioned it. There are question marks. There, there are question marks everywhere. There's talent question everywhere. So they've got the one stud. I think they go eight, nine, ten deep. Depth is not a problem. But who's starting and how good are they going to fit together? Yeah. And then you really start to zero in on Tyler Lind- Linderbaum, who I like. We, we talked about that in the draft. But it's a fair question. Does he actually fit here with the Ravens? I think I would like to see him better on the Broncos, honestly. That athleticism, the way the Broncos typically, historically, have played offensive yep. line. Yep. Um, on the Raiders, I think he would be a better fit. Um, a couple more teams here, if I if I can find them. Uh, the, the Giants, I think he would be a good fit on the Giants. Um, Vikings even the Cowboys. would have liked to have gotten him in the draft as well. Vikings, yes. Uh, so I, I think there's lots of teams where he might have been a better fit, even though I do like him as a player. You do start to question the fit here. So uh, that, that's one of the things you can point to. But you, you and I are basically in total agreement here on the Ravens, um, 17 and 19 overall. So um, number 16 for you. So 16, this is where we break into my uh, – I have four teams in this group here that are B-minuses, uh, and I have the San Francisco 49ers here. Uh, obviously, San Francisco has a lot of questions with their offensive line right now. Um, you know, with Alex Mack retiring kind of late, semi late in the middle of the offseason. Um, but but they have some pieces that that you like. Obviously, it all starts with Trent Williams, who, you know, you gave a sneak peek to your center list. Uh, this, this is the best tackle in the league, folks. And, and I, the guy is like 45 years old. Talk about Tom Brady. Uh, Trent Williams does not seem to age. And I hope I didn't just jinx him or anything. Um, but this guy is still like the the best run blocking tackle I think this league has maybe ever seen um and, and he he holds up in pass pro just fine but a guy who you always knew was really good in Washington comes to San Francisco and, and it felt like it was going to be the classic overpriced high pedigree offensive lineman gets traded when he's you know 30 years old it's not going to go well and he just it looks like he's even better so um, it obviously starts there. When you have that level of guy, you're going to be an above average group, I think, as long as you don't have a big hole. Now, that's where the left guard comes into question. Colton McKivitz, Aaron Banks, maybe even sprinkle little Jalen Moore in there. They have a lot of guys competing for that spot. I think they want it to be Aaron Banks. He's a young guy drafted, I want to say, in the third round just a couple of years ago. Um, draft second round in 2021. So, uh, a recent guy, 6'5", 325. So if he can, he's got the size, he's got some athleticism. If he can get the Shanahan offense down, uh, maybe he slides in at left guard and is great right away. And this is an even better group than I have him slotted at right now. Jake Brindle is, uh, is a guy they had on the roster who everyone seems to actually be pretty high on in terms of sliding in. He's not going to be as good as Alex Mack right away, but serviceable and is going to do what the team needs is at least what the consensus thinks. And then Daniel Brunskill and Mike McGlinchey, as long as he's healthy, I, I haven't quite seen any reports on 
if he's ready for training camp just yet. Those guys on the right side are just solid. You're good with them. You know what you're getting. Uh, Jalen Moore is probably going to play some right tackle if McClinchy uh, is out a little bit longer. But this is just a solid group overall. Um, I would have had them a little bit. I mean, I would have had them a lot higher if they had Alex Mack in this group still. I would have had them probably a little higher if I felt like they didn't just go with who they had in house at center to replace them if they had done something draft or free agency wise. But they seem to be pretty confident in them in Brindle, and that's probably why they didn't do anything as insurance. Um, so, so I have them right here. They're literally the 16th team. So this is my dead middle of, of you know the the league but I have them as an above average group, a tick above that even because of, you know, the elite left tackle that they have. You're at 16. I've got them at 12. For me at the moment, they are clinging desperately to the tail end of my upper Mm -hmm. tier. I've got them at number 12, B minus. I had them at probably a B flat, maybe even a B plus, probably a B plus before Alex Mack retired. Um, the only reason I didn't drop them farther down to the 16 level is I'm giving them a lot of credit for as a franchise for usually figuring these things out. And you mentioned it with Brendel, um, him being in play there. But after Trent Williams at left tackle, who you're right, is best tackle in football, especially in run blocking, but he holds his own in pass protection. After that, it really falls off quick. <laughs> and yeah. if it weren't for Trent Williams being there at left tackle, yeah. God yeah, forbid yeah. he gets injured and, and yeah. we've jinxed him. Uh, this offensive line is a mess, quite frankly, because there's nobody to build off of. Now, you mentioned that there's a lot of solid guys there. I like Aaron Banks. I like Mike McGlinchey. Uh, Daniel Brunskill gives them a chance. There's lots of good, solid pieces in play here, but there are no difference makers, none, after Trent Williams, at, le- at, least, at least not that they've broken through yet and we've seen it yet. I'll put it that way. But I do trust the 49ers franchise to get this figured out and get it right, and they do have Trent Williams playing left tackle, at least as of right now. Hopefully we haven't jinxed that, knock on wood. (laughs) Um, So I do expect this to be a good group. I've got them ranked number 12. Um, I'd have no problem with anybody sliding them lower, as you do. I think a lot of these teams are interchangeable, but that's kind of where I've got the 49ers, and and I I think you and I are pretty much on, on par with that. Number 15 on your list. Here it is. Here's the last big one. Here's your last red marker, the team that I am just irrationally excited about. (laughs) Really, as a whole, the more I think about it, the more I watch, well, while I'm watching the offensive line of this team, and I see the other stuff going on, and I see what they did in the draft, and I might need help because I'm I'm a little too happy about this team right now. It's the Jacksonville Jaguars. I have them at 15th. I have them all the way up here. Uh, I gave them a B minus on the offensive line, and, and here's why. Left to right, Cam Robinson, above average, good left tackle, maybe even really good left tackle. Uh, Ben Barch, solid, fine guy over there at left guard. Tyler Shatley, center, uh, pretty good. Um, Ended up playing a lot of games last year when their starting center, who has since retired, went down, was pretty good in an emergency. And they also have Luke Fortner there, from the rookie from Kentucky. So center should be pretty good. They bring in Brandon Sheriff, who, yeah, is probably going to miss some games along the way. But when he's healthy, he is every bit as good as he was two, three, four, five years ago. So so when he's healthy and out there, it's not like you're getting a lesser version of him. Um, Jawan Taylor. This is, I think, the crux for, for a lot of people um, where this group kind of ends up, because I have a feeling you're going to say the same things as me, left tackle to right guard. Um Jawan Taylor is, is the, the linchpin of this. I like Jawan Taylor's tape. I, I really He's a really good mover in space, and, and I'm imagining what him and Sheriff can look like if they're getting out and doing something. This team likes to run, well, at least last year. This is the other thing, the Jaguars. We have no idea what's going to happen, right? Um, but if they want to do things where they're getting out in space on the right side with screens or outside runs, Sheriff and Taylor can do that together for sure. Um, his, he uses his hands really well on pass pro. Uh, what I really like to see is an offensive lineman not just let somebody come into their body and say, okay, I'm going to just try to be a bear and get them in my grasp and, and hold on to them. He uses his hands early. He uses his hands early. He readjusts them. He's really good with hand fighting. Um, and he just keeps it up all the way through his kick step. And then, you know, when, when he's just kind of standing solid. So I really like all the pieces with him. 
Uh, is it as consistent as you would like it to be? No. Can he struggle with some speed to power um, in terms of can he get his anchor set while he's on the move? Can he get himself set quickly? Not always. So that's something you would like to have him clean up. But if he's got Brandon Sheriff there next to him to kind of try to help clean some of that up, Sheriff's going to keep an eye on him a little bit. If he sees that kind of speed to power coming or sees him slipping a bit, he's there to help. Uh, that's an upgrade over AJ Ken, who we talked about in the last video um, when it comes to pass pro. Run blocking, this guy's going to be good to go. You're going to be fine. You're, you're going to get a solid push, but if you want to go to the outside, you're especially going to look good. Um, but it's in pass pro that you get the inconsistencies. And, and when your pass protection is moving from AJ Can to Brandon Sheriff, that's a huge upgrade, specifically even in just that area. So I think that's going to help this team a lot. I'm not putting them in my elite group. I'm not putting them in my even good group, but I think they're going to be pretty nice offensive line. I think they're going to be a couple ticks above your average group. Um, I really like Robinson, Shatley, Sheriff. I like Taylor. I know I might be a little irrational on that. We could see it could blow up in my face. Uh, Barch is solid. Um, so, yeah, we'll see where we're at with Jacksonville. How, how low do you have them? I've got them at 24. So, and, and I see everything you're saying. Um, I'm going to say basically the same thing about the Jaguars as I'm going to say about the Giants. And the good news is you are already way, way, way better than you were the past two, three, four seasons. Way better. Just to add in Brandon Sheriff, I, you know, in the discussion, right? Um, here, here's where it falls off after that for me. I'm not as high on any of the other four guys as you are. Now, I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt because I know I haven't spent as much time on video on the AFC South and I think you've spent a lot more time on the Jaguars' offensive line and videotape than I have. So I'm willing to which get the, by the way out there. Which, by the way, makes you a healthier person than I am. But, you know, <laughs> think about what you just said. I've spent a lot more time on the AFC South offensive line. That's not a good thing. It, it, let's, let's be honest. So just everybody keep that in mind. Yeah, I, I'm no better than you. <laughs> My videotape has been on other things just as equally sick. So I <laughs> – they have don't ask yourself this here. This is the offensive line video. Don't don't, right? don't tell everybody your other sicknesses. <laughs> the uh, they have a chance, and, and they're going to be competitive. I have no problem with that, and I think as long as Sheriff continues to be healthy in years to come, uh, I, I think they'll be even better next year. I'm not as high on Cam Robinson as you are. To me, he's a solid left tackle, and that's kind of where I've got him slotted. I think that's probably because he's kind of a dual nature. Sometimes he just explodes and dominates, and other times I think he's a little sloppy, to be honest. So that's probably the dual nature of Robinson. I'm not as high on Ben Barch as you are. Um, this is his, what, third season, I think? He played in 2021. Yeah, this, this is his mm -hmm. third season. I just haven't seen enough. He, he shows flashes. I'm not convinced that he's a lockdown starter. Um, but again, you've watched more tapes. I'm always willing to give you the benefit on, on this team. I'm, I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt here. Tyler Shatley, I think they're fine at center, but he's an upgradable spot to me next off season. I think they, they might consider upgrading him. But I think you mentioned Luke Fortner. Fortner may already win that job anyway. So Good, very well. whatever, they're, they're, they're fine at center. And then of course we get to Jawan Taylor. Um, from what I've seen, Taylor's the guy that you want to dominate. You want him to, I, 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 and you mentioned it, but he hasn't done that yet. So mm -hmm. you, you mentioned he's the linchpin. If he starts to show up playing beside Brandon Shore, Sheriff, just like you said, if he starts to benefit off of that and he can start to use that athleticism and use that quickness and use those hands um, instead of the people he's been playing beside, <laughs> you could see a huge jolt here. So if Taylor steps up, this offensive line looks way different. Because they, then they start to push people around. I think you and I are in agreement on offensive lines in general. If you have three spots that you think you can win the battles at each week or most weeks, now you can start to push people around and you have the advantage on the line. I'm not sure the Jaguars have that, but if Taylor steps up and playing beside Cher, if he might, then they do start to get that. And that's that's where the, uh, the old seesaw starts to swing in their favor. Um, so – I'm with you all the way on what you're saying. I just haven't my, – my hope for them isn't as great as, as what you're seeing on tape. So um, I've got the Jaguars at 24, and you're at 15. 
And I think you have what, two more teams here on, on this more, one? Tier? Yep, two more, okay. two more. So here at 14, uh, another kind of surprising team, but I think I think everyone's kind of on the same page with these guys. It's the New York Jets. Um, I like what the Jets have done over the last couple of years building this offensive line. It's not like, you know, you just mentioned the Giants who have, you know, overhauled it all at once, or even the Panthers, just like three or four positions brand new. Uh, the, the Jets have built this thing a little bit over time. So uh, Connor McGovern's been there for a while. Makai Becton's been there for a while. Elijah Vera Tucker was a rookie last year. George Fant last year was his, I don't know if it was technically his rookie year, but it was the first year that he was really a full-time starter for, for the Jets. Uh, nope, I'm wrong about that. 2020. So uh, it was the first time he was at left tackle, which is where he's going to be slotted this year. He kind of, with Makai Becton going down in week one, Fant slid over to left tackle, was really good, and it doesn't seem like he's losing that spot. Um, and then in addition to that, they add like in Tomlinson from free agency. When you can add something kind of bit by bit, um, it, it definitely helps, you know, your that year projection. Now, some teams like the Bills, for example, they have hit things in their rebuild one thing at a time. So they've hit the entire offensive line and the entire skill group. Um, that's good if you can do it. Like you've said with the Giants, maybe it doesn't you don't see all the fruits of that labor right away that first year. But you see an improvement and then maybe you get the real benefit of it later on. The Jets have slowly and slowly improved this thing. And, and Lincoln Tomlinson was kind of the last nail in the coffin for me to say, I don't have any questions here. Uh, I really, I like their two tackles. I really like their two guards. Uh, I don't like Connor McGovern quite as much, but you know, he's going to be in between all of those guys. I think it's going to be fine. Um, depth wise. I don't really have too much for them. I mean, like I said, so Morgan, Mo Morgan Moses came left from here to go to Baltimore Nate Herbert big is a guy that that could be pretty good. Uh, Max Mitchell is a guy that I like actually uh, from Louisiana Lafayette. So they have a little bit of depth here, um, but I really like this often this starting group. And, and this is kind of my first team. This is my line in the sand of, Hey, I really like all five guys that are out here and I, I don't have many questions. You have them at 14. When we started this video i was i was you know somewhat familiar with the jets offensive line as i as i am all all the offensive lines all the all the players but as i started studying the jets and i started studying this list i couldn't believe <laughs> where i was putting the jets they just yep. continued to push up and up and up and up i've got them at number nine here kind of interchangeable with about i don't know three other teams here yep. um but i'm comfortable with them at number nine and I haven't looked at other lists yet. I, I've purposely avoided all the other lists this summer. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't looked at them, so I don't know where other people are putting the Jets. I am 100% comfortable putting them at number nine. Joe Douglas, the, the, the Jets general manager, we mentioned it uh, in, the, in, the in the division videos. He's done such a good job here. And if they leave him alone, I think he'll continue doing an even better job. Um, the, the one caveat here, they don't seem to have a – one single dominant offensive player. So for people who want to drag them back down the list a little bit to a 14 or to a 16, I totally understand. But I like this offensive line, starting with George Fant at left tackle. He's not dominant, but I like him at left tackle. He'll hold his own there. He'll be competitive. Um, Lakin Tomlinson, I think, is an above-average guard. I, I think he has a chance at Pro Bowls. Don't, he may already have been voted Pro Bowls. I don't know. Don't even care. But uh, I like Tomlinson as above average. I think they start winning battles there at left guard. Connor McGovern, I think, is a good, solid starter. Uh, he, at times, he's inconsistent, but most weeks he'll be a good, solid starter there at center. Elijah Vera Tucker, you mentioned it in the division videos. In his rookie season, he looked good. This is the second year he should explode. I, I hadn't considered that in the division videos, but I have now. Uh, I think Vera Tucker, I called him the weak link before. He's just young. So he, he ought to explode past what he was as a rookie. And then that brings us to Makai Becton. Now, a lot of people were talking about moving Becton around or, or maybe Becton's going to be a bust. I still think Becton can be a very good tackle in this league. It, maybe not your Hall of Fame all pro level, but, man, he's so fast. <laughs> he's so big. He blocks really well. He just needs to work. He needs to get playing time at one spot, and he needs to work on pass protection. That's really what he needs to work on. But even if he doesn't 
explode to high levels. I think you lock him in at right tackle. I think you're fine. Yep. You get past that. So I, I like their starting five. You get past that, I actually like their depth. And that's probably why I've got them higher. Um, mm-hmm. I like Connor McDerm- McDermott at tackles. Mm-hmm. I like Dan Feeney in the interior. I think he's just good and tough. He's, he's not very polished, but good, tough. Nate Herbig, of course, you mentioned him. I think that might be their best depth. You mentioned Max Mitchell. Might, might or may not get on the playing field this year. And um, there's one other guy here I, I've lost track of. I've got them going about eight or nine deep here. Really like this offensive line for the Jets. Not that they're going to dominate. I don't think they are. I, I don't put them anywhere near the elite group who can dominate, push people around. They are not going to do that. But this Jets offensive line has been so bad <laughs> over the past few years. It, not last year, but, but in the years before, 2019, I think 2020. Mm-hmm. Just some of the worst offensive line play you'll see. They have come so far. I've got them up here at nine on the list, but I can see them dropping down to the 14 area. Very, very happy with the work that the Jets have done here on offensive line. So uh, number 13 for you. I think this is your last one in our middle group, yep. correct? Yep. yep, this is the last of the middle guys here. And I will say, based on just talent alone, this could be in for you, might be a top 10 group. But because of all the changes, I have them here at 13. I think it's just going to take a little time to gel, and you can't always assume. Similar to the Giants, who I have at 19. Uh, similar to the, uh, let's see, who else did we talk about? Anyways, whatever. Um, the Cincinnati Bengals, I have here at 13. I have this as my last B minus group. And if I were just going off of names and talent alone, would probably have them higher. But when you have your entire right side of the line uh, being brand new, it's it's hard to say from day one you're going to be one of the top 12 offensive lines in the league. So I have them at 13. Right. Left to right, Jonah Williams, good. Uh, left guard, Jackson Carmen, eh, fine. We'll probably look a lot better with Ted Karras there at center that's, next to him. Um, yes. That That is your one weak link. So that's the other thing that kind of keeps them out. You don't really want any weak links. But the rest of these guys, I mean, these names here, Ted Karras at center, Alex Kappa coming in at right guard. Lyle Collins coming in at right tackle, one of the best tackles in the league. Um, I mean, he has his he has his faults. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not going to necessarily put him in my top five tackles. But from a talent standpoint, what he can do in the AFC North, what he can do with Joe Mixon running behind him. Um, uh, this guy's big. He's fast. He's physical. He's a great fit there. Alex Kappa, we saw what he's been doing in Tampa Bay for the last couple of years. He's going to be a great fit. I think it's just going to take them some time to gel and none of these guys are perfect. Jackson Carmen has his faults. That's for sure. But, but these five guys, I think by the end of the year are going to be a top 10 offensive line. Uh, but here going into the season, I'm not quite there. So I have them at 13. We are, we are 99% dialed in on this team. I've got them at number 15 for me. Um, Joe Burrow should basically be taking these guys out to lunch every day. Oh he should be God, buying yeah. them watches and PlayStations and whatever the heck else Absolutely. they want. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Joe Burrow might be out of the league in two years if they didn't upgrade that offensive line. He getting beat to death every week, and, and he astounded us all. The entire Bengals, Bengals franchise did last year with that Super Bowl run and, and had every reason to win that game. It just didn't happen. You know, they, just, they did lose. But it, this offensive line is so much better. And, you know, I don't. I haven't studied how much money they've invested on the offensive line, and this is the one team that I don't care. I really don't care. I don't care how much yeah, you money you spent it. in the offseason. Mm-hmm. You had to upgrade Absolutely. and get protection in front of Joe Burrow, who is the best mm-hmm. thing that has ever happened to your franchise. I mean, <laughs> to, to not do it, uh, it would just be a crying shame. You would be asking to get fired. <laughs> so this offensive line is way, way, way better. I've got them at number 15 for all the reasons you said. Jonah Williams, left tackle, good, st- solid starting tackle. Um, Ted Karras at center, lock him in, no doubt starter. Alex Kappa, lock him in, right guard starter. And Lyle Collins is the stud that you're looking for. He's the guy who's who's going to win most of his battles. Again, you mentioned he's not going to win them all, but I've got him maybe winning. And I'm not talking about win right here, but just week in and week out, he probably wins about 80 to 85% of his battles, you know. So, you can build off of that. Everybody else builds off of that. So, And that does leave you with Jackson Carmen, who is, is the weak link. But he's in his second year. So maybe 
maybe you hope for some development. If not, oh well, you start sending fullbacks and tack, uh, fullbacks and tight ends over his way, or you know, you run away from him. Whatever. Um, the the only reason that I don't like this offensive line is the depth. Um, Cordell Volson, fourth round, maybe uh, yep, maybe he gets a like chance Cordell. to do something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, Trey Hill in the interior. Um, I think provides you some depth, not a lot. After that, there's a huge drop off. So if anybody gets injured, um, yeah. if, if this starting five can play all year, all the way through the playoffs, I think you're right. I think they can push up into the top ten. But one injury, one injury, and there's a huge drop off here from these top four guys. So that's troubling, but I get it. You know, if you're the Bengals, you can't fix everything in a single off season. So <laughs> – you got the guys in front of Burrow, and next year I think they should start drafting more and getting that pipeline of offensive linemen here behind the expensive guys who are on your line. So love it, love every bit of it. Totally agree with you here. And, um, you know, I think that rounds out your middle tier here, doesn't it? Yep, that's it. So, I mean, those, those 11, yeah, 11 teams, you could almost flip-flop them any sort of way, uh, especially right. that, that bottom seven or in this top four here. Um, all good. I mean, they're, they're all, I think, good groups. They're going to be an asset to their team winning. I think maybe some of the teams in that below tier you can win with. These are teams that are going to help you win. And, and when we eventually get to these top 12, they're going to be, you know, the reasons you win. And, you know, so be sure to take a look at that. 100% agree. There's a lot of interchangeability here. And I'm sure someone out there listening, if they're still hanging on this video, they're probably saying, you've got to be kidding. How could this offensive line be that high or that low? But when you start comparing these teams one to another, you start to see the breakdowns and you start to see, well, this team has no studs, no dominant player, or this team, their depth is horrible, or this team has two starters that you love. And then after that, there's tons of question marks. The breakdowns start to get really obvious the more you study it. So um, again, a lot of interchangeability here in the middle, as you mentioned. Um, so you can stack these teams a lot of different ways. I've enjoyed it. Simon, um, tell everybody some of the content they can find you on, different places they can find you if they want to. Yeah, so uh, written words, uh, phantomsportsindustries.com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Simon underscore short with two T's. I link all my stuff out there and then you can go find the podcast, uh, the Simon short podcast where I do football, all sports, uh, a lot of, uh, pop culture type things as well. So uh, a little bit of everything over there that's on Apple, Spotify, Google, and Amazon now. So take a look. Appreciate it. This is already a long video, so it's not going to hurt us to, to dwell on this for a second. But tell people, you know, you mentioned pop culture stuff. I've listened to quite a bit of it. Yeah. <laughs> so tell people what all you get into pop culture wise in addition to the sports side of things. Man, we are. I mean, it's the middle of the summer, so it's it's the downtime for football, but it's the peak time for fandom. So if you're into to comic book culture, that kind of stuff, uh, anything that's made its way to TV, we're reviewing. So. The last two episodes, I've re- uh, reviewed the Obi-Wan series on Disney Plus with Robertson Byer. I've reviewed, uh, I did a whole episode on the Umbrella Academy season three, Thor Love uh-huh. and Thunder, and uh, <laughs> the Miss Marvel show on Disney Plus. I did a whole episode on just that stuff with Muhammad Mehdi. Um, so yeah, man, take a look. I'm, uh, we have a, uh, I'll throw it out here. Who cares? Um Muhammad is going to be back later this summer. We're going to rank every MCU movie that's out, all 29 movies. So I'm I'm doing yes. my rewatch of those right now. That's a blast. Uh, we'll see. Uh, it's 11, 18 p.m. right now. We'll see if I get to another one tonight, but um, be ready for that one. Yeah, it's a, it's a ton of fun. So you think I'm nerdy talking about the offensive line? No, I'm, I'm stereotypically nerdy as well. I, I've got that stuff covered. We, we got time for it here. A few extra minutes isn't going to hurt anything in terms of viewership. I'm going to ask you a question that we did not prep for at all, but I'm Great. sure you've got an answer for. In the MCU universe, um, I guess that's redundant. But anyway, <laughs> in the MCU universe, who's your all-time favorite character? Who's the one that you're most you're locked oh, into, fascinated by? It. I mean, it's Captain America, man. That's where it really okay. got started for me. So I was in high school when when the movie started, so 2008 with Iron Man One. Uh, Captain America came out just before my senior year. So I watched that movie. That was the one that I liked the best. I went to see all the movies. I wasn't too into it at the time. Um, 
I happened to, I, we'll get really uh, into it here. I worked at JCPenney. They have a lot of those graphic t-shirts. I got a Captain America one for like eight bucks. I wore that to class one day. My high school government teacher, Mr. Mr. Stapleford, shout out, is a huge comic book nerd. He saw me wear the shirt. He handed me a hundred dollar comic book, uh, the complete death of Captain America. Wow. Um, to, to read. I uh, said, just bring it back before the end of the year. I read it and I was hooked from then on. Uh, so that was what kind of kickstarted everything for me. I got into comic books at that time. Um, so shout out to him. And uh, yeah, man, it's a lot of fun. So yeah, Captain America, the, the Chris Evans was a perfect casting. He plays the part so well. Uh, he's just that like uh, for very, he does it so well, despite everything else he's ever done is like completely the opposite of, of, of Steve Rogers, which is part of what makes it so interesting, I think. So uh, yeah, right. ton of fun. All right. So that's the Simon Short podcast. You can catch all <laughs> kinds of things, especially during the summer, but uh, I'm sure throughout the year as well. Simon, I've enjoyed it. Um, let's gear up and we'll do the uh, we'll do the uh, the elites and the very goods. All right. Fantastic. Let's do it. Appreciate it. All right. See you next time. Goodbye, everybody.